Okay, now, continuing along in the podcast, I'd just like to remind you that here were our major topics in the unit, constant acceleration problems in one dimension, and we already spent a fair amount of time uh, practicing such a problem with the tortoise and the hare. There's dealing with forces in two dimensions, and as I had mentioned to you, we have a podcast on free body diagrams, so for reasons of time, let me refer you to uh, that podcast to review that material. Next are projectile problems, which then I'm going to now uh, take a look at and spend some time with, and I'm not sure we're going to have time to actually work through examples on circular and orbital motion, but I will say that projectile problems are generally some of the most tricky, so I'm going to uh, work through a detailed example with you for that, and then hoping that you'll be able to uh, master circular and orbital motion on your own. If not, certainly please come by the Learning Center to get help on those. But given our priorities, I would say let's focus on the projectile problems. Okay, so projectile problems. <clears throat> the main key in the projectile problems is that these are generally constant acceleration problems. There's a constant acceleration in the problem, and that acceleration is in generally the y direction, the vertical direction, and it's a negative acceleration because things accelerate in the downward direction, and the acceleration is equal to the acceleration of gravity, g. And then the basic idea is to use those three basic formulas that one always uses in constant acceleration problems. One relating velocities and time, another relating positions and time, and the other relating velocities and position. And to use those forms then to uh, solve uh, independent problems because the motion in X and Y are completely independent. What makes projectile problems kind of tricky, though, is that although the motion in X and Y is um, independent and can be analyzed as independent constant acceleration problems, generally speaking, the way these problems are phrased, they require you to make certain connections between the uh, motion in X and Y. And there are two basic types that one generally sees, although there may be others. But the two most common types are where you are given some total magnitude of the velocity information, which then is going to link together the x and y velocities, and thereby link together the x and y parts of the motion via reference to some known velocity. Or sometimes what you do to connect x and y is a time coincidence. In other words, in the example we're going to see, if you throw an object, uh, the uh, range of the object, how far it travels, has to do with the fact that it's traveling along in the x direction until it comes back and hits the ground. And so when the y motion brings you back to the ground, that is the coincidence in time whereby you want to see how far you've traveled in the x direction. And we'll see this in detail coming up. So those are the two main types of uh, connection one would make. And so the problem uh, that I thought would be kind of fun to analyze is, you know, have you ever wondered if someone would uh, be able to throw a ball up into, say, uh, one of the clock tower windows? C can a human being actually accomplish that? So to kind of estimate whether or not that's realistic, I'm going to use two key pieces of information. Uh, of course, we're going to neglect things like air resistance and whether it's easier to throw something down a field or straight up in the air. We'll, we'll, we'll forego worrying about all of that. <clears throat> but just looking at the basic plausibility of the situation, let's consider a quarterback who can throw uh, a football down a 100-meter range, which is uh, pretty good. That's more than 100 yards, okay? And the question is going to be whether or not that quarterback, if he threw a ball, uh, would he be able, straight up, would he be able to reach the top of the clock tower on campus, which is about 50 meters tall?